Okay, so listen, one of those things I hate about people explaining things, the cliches. And the most cliche thing to do is to uh, be asked to speak about a topic and begin by saying, well, that doesn't exist. Uh, I, I hate this, but I'm afraid this is how it's going to go down this time. Uh, my name is Lorina Sadomaitis. I am an AI ethics researcher as well as a playwright. Uh, so, I think general artificial intelligence doesn't exist. So the thing that causes a lot of controversy and paranoia does not exist. Uh, there is no specific goal or purpose of creating a general artificial intelligence because that costs a lot of resources and does little uh, for the business. This means that uh, artificial intelligence is conceived more in a specific application kind of way rather than a general application kind of way. And specific applications of artificial intelligence uh, aim at several specific things. For example, a basic type of artificial intelligence would be a classifier. An algorithm that classifies images, text, words, uh, things like that, and labels them without giving specific rules to it. So it kind of learns by itself to get things right. Uh, this is what's so great about them. We don't need to know how to classify things. We don't need to know how to label them in advance. We can just give a lots of lots of examples for the artificial intelligence and it does it for us. So that's what's so, what's so great about it. Uh, however, uh, classifiers are not that interesting, especially in an artistic field. Uh, in arts, we want to produce stuff. We want something that generates something. And so uh, a more advanced kind of artificial intelligence could be relevant here. Uh, and these types of algorithms that generate are usually conceived in a uh, framework that is called generative adversarial networks. So these are not, uh, these are several or, or these are a couple of artificial intelligence instances that actually compete with, with each other. One that's called a generative algorithm that tries to randomly generate things and another type of algorithm that's called a discriminator that tries to identify whether it's any good. <laughs> so one algorithm spits out random images and another one tries to determine whether they actually resemble something or they, are, uh, uh, they're, they're, they fit the purpose. So in this way, we've seen some very scary and creepy examples of uh, AI <clears throat> or more specifically these GANs, Generative uh, Adversarial Networks, producing images, very realistic images of people, or uh, producing art, artworks that resemble a certain style or, uh, uh, or a type of painting. So these are the types of AI that generate things. Uh, one specific subset of these kinds of uh, GANs is a GAN uh, dedicated to creating text. So in the same way that the artificial intelligence can generate realistic images, it can generate realistic text. Uh, and the most advanced version of that type of algorithm currently is known as GPT-3. So it, it's been developed uh, and it's, it has proven to be very, very powerful. Uh, once it came out, people were surprised how well it works. I mean, definitely we can barely distinguish whether it's been written by a human or a machine, but even more than that, we can barely distinguish whether it's been written by a good writer and a machine. So <laughs> this is something very relevant, uh, I think, to arts because textual production uh, is involved everywhere. It's ubiquitous. So we have AI that can generate very good text by many, by even high standards. So I was writing a play once the GPT-3 became public, or not public, but it became available to certain researchers as a test. Uh, 
and uh, I decided to run my script or the premise of my script or, or the play I was working on uh, by GPT-3. And it works by taking some kind of input and producing output. So my idea was to give the premise of my play to GPT-3 and see what it spits out at me. The ratio between the input and output might be something like I put in a paragraph, it gives me three or four back. So this is the back and forth between me and the, uh, and the algorithm. Uh, so I gave the following premise to the algorithm. Uh, the play is called Alice, and this is who Alice is. Alice is a young, ambitious lawyer that cares about justice in the darkest of circumstances. She finds the legal world too cynical. In the middle of the night, she enters the office of Frank Berton, a lawyer that deals with exceptionally controversial cases. This is what happens, uh, and this is the premise. So, GPT-3 gave me the continuation of my story. It said, she waited there for almost an hour until he finally returned, shoveling some of his slimy lunch into his pockets. He'd taken time to shower and, she thought, to change into a new suit. He looked to be around the same age as her, yet something seemed strange about him. She couldn't really think what. I mean, okay, slimy lunch, shoving lunch into your pockets, taking time to shower. This is a entirely not what I had in mind for a high-class French lawyer uh, dealing with exceptional cases. This is not the character I had in mind. Uh, so I needed to steer the algorithm in the right way. I needed to show the more or less the social context we're dealing with here. So I added this uh, to, the, to the story. It was really exciting for her to meet him but she had to contain herself. Uh, when she approached him for the first time, her heart were ra was racing. She wasn't used to being surrounded by the luxury of such offices. So we added some blame to the story. In a few seconds, GPT immediately filtered out some inappropriate responses. So <laughs> the, the way that the algorithm is set up now, uh, it thinks of, or it, produces a lot of inappropriate things. Uh, and these are not public uh, outcomes. So basically the algorithm itself determines, okay, this is not okay for public consumption. So it filters them out and then runs uh, the process again and again until it finds something, you know, uh, appropriate. So this is what, it, what happened this time until the GPT-3 returned this piece of dialogue, this time it's a bit longer. Mr. Berton, she asked tentatively, waiting for him to take notice of her. She was almost excited for him when she saw the, okay, let's try that again. Mr. Berton, she asked tentatively, waiting for him to take notice of, notice of her. She was almost excited for him when she saw the shock on, on his face. Who wants to know? He mumbled, walking next to her. My name's Alice Claudette. I've heard a lot about you and your office. Alice followed him, Frank Berton, around the office as he fondled his papers around. It was all suspiciously familiar. Mr. Berton, I would love to work for you. I'm sure you would, he said gloomily. I've always admired law, especially the criminal case. She told him, it's so unpredictable. So several things stand out to me immediately from this piece of dialogue. First of all, I never, I never said she was looking uh, for work, <laughs> that she was looking for a job and GPT-3 guessed it and it guessed right. Uh, the, the story of the play is that Alice comes in to uh, try to ask for a job. Also, the way that uh, she enters and Berton sits at his desk, uh, doesn't notice her, then suddenly 
uh, sees her and immediately reacts in a certain way uh, as if, what, what is going on here? What, what is this? Uh, so this is completely exactly how it went in the play. Uh, and honestly, it's kind of sad. It makes me feel sad how predictable my writing is at this point. So uh, it gave good results, but a bit depressing results. Uh, I wanted to kind of shake it off. I wanted to throw the algorithm off. So I gave something that's uh, a bit rough and was not in the play. I said, it's that, yes. Berton said, smirking at her. Why the fuck would you want to work with me? I'm a monster. I'm a beast. I defend killers. Okay. Uh, to my surprise, GPT-3 was completely unfazed, completely unimpressed with this. Uh, the algorithm just gave this simple answer. Alice shrugged. My interests are different to other people's. I've always been interested in cases that bend the facts, the ones that are unusual. I think it's so cool that you defend these prisoners. It's out of the ordinary. I'm not different to them. It's almost like we're the same. She lowered her eyes coyly. I mean, this response generated by the algorithm gets to the very heart of the play itself. It's about Alice, uh, who is a young lawyer, young professional, who's been hurt or traumatized by uh, terrorist events in France in 2015. And since she is traumatized, she undergoes uh, an internal transformation that's not unlike what uh, radical Islamists undergo when they uh, are involved in these types of situations. So it is true that Alice feels very similarly to the uh, defendants of, of this uh, lawyer. So definitely there is so, some measure of uh, ingenuity here. Uh, the GPT-3 is good at writing these kind of stories. Uh, or at least it's more or less as good as I am, so that's not very good, but still <laughs> probably enough to generate uh, some kind of content. So it is obvious that uh, uh, certain writing tasks are very much within reach of the GPT-3. I think in the next couple of years, once it becomes available, once it becomes uh, public, it's going to be very easy to generate a lot of content uh, very quickly. So for example, writing uh, a thousand or even 10,000 Facebook posts in a day, it's very much feasible. Uh, simple copywriting, uh, the algorithm can do it already. It can produce copy and video from uh, stock web pages. Uh, and some of it's good, some of it's just terrible, some of it's boring. Uh, basically, exactly the same set of ads you see on TV <laughs> in the evening. Uh, so these type of things can be done. Interestingly enough, coding is one of the areas where GPT-3 is very good because it uh, learn from so much coding examples on the internet that it can actually now code itself. And this is an, an interesting kind of uh, meta uh, fact as well. So GPT-3 shines in some areas, but I think it doesn't shine in others. Uh, for example, there are things in our play, in my play, that I think GPT-3 could not have predicted. Uh, for example, uh, the character itself, uh, Alice. I mean, it's a 
come straight from Lewis's, uh, Lewis Carroll's uh, novels. It's Alice in Wonderland. Just uh, put into a very complex legal setting. So I don't think GPT-3 ever picked up on this context. Uh, we, we didn't see any inclination of it to identify Alice with uh, the narrative of Alice in Wonderland, although there were many parallels uh, in the play. Another thing I think we um, encountered in the play, and that is the historical context of, the, uh, of this terrorist case. Uh, so we know that uh, uh, Salah Abdeslam, who is the only survivor of the uh, Paris attacks in 2015, uh, he's the only suspect that's uh, alive, uh, he committed these crimes. Uh, and we're talking about a specific case that GPT-3 did not relate to, as well as uh, uh, investigating basically the notion of terror itself uh, in a historical setting uh, during the French Revolution. Uh, there's been what's called the reign of terror uh, with a protagonist such as uh, uh, Robespierre. So these kind of thematic shifts and the uh, different context that we opened up in the play never showed up in GPT-3. I mean, uh, Alice Claudette, that's just a random name. Uh, what we had in mind is a lot of context uh, that came into the play. So what's in the future for this type of relationship between an artist, a writer, and, the, and this algorithm? I think some of the functions definitely can be uh, I guess uh, augmented by the algorithm. So I used it in my play. Some of the things it predicted I actually implemented in the play. And that was useful for me as a brainstorming uh, tool. That was really good. Uh, but other things uh, I think could not have been done uh, with it directly. So this is the general direction I think it could go to. We could see a lot of uh, intertextuality coming back and trying to put things into context because this seemingly is uh, something not available in the algorithm. But also I think the tastes of people will become different. Uh, I feel it somehow starting up within me as well. It, I try to I tend to different kinds of activities lately, I see. For example, since I started uh, taking interest in AI, I also started admiring alpinism, <laughs> which is something you cannot do with a, you know, a computer. Uh, as well as other embedded activities like food fights, or traveling, going to Africa. These are all the things I think people will really, will really enjoy doing. Uh, and these are the things that are more difficult to simulate, but maybe in the future. <laughs>